Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom, though you've captured me. I've got joy instead of mourning. There's beauty, yeah. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom though you captured me. I've got joy instead of mourning. You give me joy down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. You give me joy. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom, there's freedom though you captured me. I've got joy instead of mourning. You give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. You give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. I'd never be so free. Calling your love for me, he loves me. I've never been more secure knowing your so when he loves me. I've never been so free. Calling your love for me, I've never been more secure knowing your heart, Lord. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul, you give me joy. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Hey, thank you for your joy, Lord. Joy is my strength, Lord. Yeah, yeah. in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. You give me joy, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. You give me joy, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul, you give me joy. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, you give me joy. Oh yes, Lord, thank you for your joy, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your joy, Lord. Oh, we bless and praise your name, God. my 
myself, I give myself to you. myself to you. Oh, let's worship. <laughs> my life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. My life is not my own. No. Life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself myself to you. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you so much for being who you are, for never changing on us, for being the same yesterday, today, and evermore. You are a glorious Father. You are a good, good Father. And we thank you that you're not so far away from us that we cannot receive your help, your presence, and be in your presence at all times. You know, the 145th Psalm in verse 18 tells us, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him sincerely and in truth. That simply means those who would come into relationship, those who want God to be near them. You call upon him sincerely and truthfully. He is there. That's the beautiful thing about our father. He's not some distant God. He's not so far up in the heavenlies that he cannot be right here on earth with us. Yes, as we call upon him, as we call upon him in truth and sincerity, he is here. And that's what he desires with all of his creation. He desires that closeness. He desires that oneness with us all so that we are in relationship with him and know that he is right there for us at all times. Whoa, isn't that a great place to be? So, Father, we thank you. That we get to be in your presence, Father, when we call upon you in sincerity and in truth, you are there. 
You are there for us, available when we need you to be our comfort, to be our guide, to be our teacher, to be just a good, good father, to provide all that we need. Be that shelter, be that love, be that care or concern, you are there. And so we thank you for all these things that you have given to us so freely, Father. You've given to us the gifts and talents that you've placed on the inside of us to be better servants to you, Father. And we glorify your name for that. We thank you for our big brother, Jesus, who lived for us, who died for us, and who lived once again when you raised him up so that we may have life with you in close proximity and abundance to the full until it overflows. We thank you for all these things now. In the matchless name of Jesus, we declare them to be so. Amen, amen, and amen. Yes, yes, we indeed have a good, good father who just always wants to be near us in relationship with him. So with that, I want to welcome you all out to this fantastic first Wednesday. Yes. Now, if this is your first time joining us, we want to thank you and we want to let you know that you are our honored guest. So if you would, please do me a favor. Look in the chat. You'll see a link come up and click on that link and what? and fill out the information on the connection card that comes up. Now with the information that we give, that you give to us, we just want to know how we can better serve you. And what we'll do is present to you the opportunity to live your best life yet with Almighty God. Now if, you, if you'd like, you could also text the word connect to the number on your screen, that's 954-280-2076. Again, the connection card will come up and please fill that out in its entirety. And with that information, we just want to better serve you. Now, let's continue with this fantastic first Wednesday. And what we'll do now is that we'll get to worship with our giving. Yes, it's the opportunity to give back to God free. So what he has already given to us so freely. So we get to participate on giving. Now, we are just giving addicts here at Impact. Say it with me. I'm a giving addict. Yes, indeed. Now, on the screen, you should see the various ways in which you can give. You can visit our website, impactsofl.com. And what you can do there is do what we like to call automate the important. You can set up recurring giving. That's where you can go into our website, fill out the information, and set up your giving so that you can set it and forget it. That's sweatless victory every time. Now, while you're preparing your offering, just want to read a passage of scripture for you from Proverbs 10, verse 22, also in the Amplified Classic. And it reads, the blessing of the Lord, it makes truly rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Neither does toiling and toiling increase it. That says it all. The blessing of the Lord, it makes truly rich. Now, this is the beautiful thing about the blessing of the Lord. We're not just talking about money. You can be blessed richly in wisdom and spiritual growth and development. You can be blessed richly in many things outside of money. But those things that are in the purpose and the plan and the will of Almighty God for your life, you can be blessed richly. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with money. It is a great tool to be used by us to increase God's kingdom. So you can be blessed and increased richly in that. But there are so many more things to be increased, bitch, increased with richly in the kingdom of Almighty God. Now, I trust that you've done all that you're going to do to prepare your offering. Let's just lift it up to uh, our high priest, Jesus. I'm going to lift up my electronic device. Already made, already did my, uh, my giving. So just let's pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege and opportunity we have to be able to give back unto you what you've so freely given to us, to be able to sow into your kingdom and into the good ground of Impact Church of South Florida. We thank you so much that as we are doing so, you are bringing us back a, a 100-fold return on our seed sown. And we thank you for that. And we say to the ministering angels that are assigned to us, go forth and bring us back that, re that return. For we have greater need of it to increase God's kingdom here on the earth as he has purposed, planned, designed, and ordained. We give you glory, honor, and praise for all these things now and declare them to be so in the matchless name of Jesus. Now, let's get back to our fantastic First Wednesday.
Hello, Impact family. Welcome to First Wednesday. My name is Isaiah, and I'm a part of the Impact Church Dream Team. Let's find out what's happening at your Impact Church in South Florida. We invite you to join us Sunday, June 19th for Father's Day as we honor and celebrate awesome dads. You can join us in person at our 10 a.m. worship experience. Join us for our Recognition Sunday on June 12th during our 10 a.m. worship experience. We will be taking time out to recognize and celebrate individuals who have graduated or have completed a certificate program. You don't have to do life alone this summer. Take the step to find freedom by participating in one of our six-week summer small groups starting this month on June 12th. Go to impactsofl.com and click on small groups to find a group that's right for you. Students from 6th to 12th grades, you still have four days left to register to attend Fuge Camps for a life-changing experience through Christ. Fuge Camp will take place from July 11th to 15th. Sunday, June 5th is the last day to register. And the Unchained Basketball Challenge is also a few days away. It's this Saturday, June 4th from 4 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Get ready to show your basketball skills or cheer for your favorite team. Tickets are just $10 and are available at Eventbrite at icevents.eventbrite.com. You can register to participate in the Halftime Knockout Contest or the Three Point Contest. Go to icevents.eventbrite.com or scan the QR code on your screen for more information. This month, we'll be rolling up our sleeves and learning how to make a greater impact in our communities as Pastor Anthony introduces a new message series entitled, Roll Up Our Sleeves. Don't sit back and watch a hurting world suffer and not get involved. Join us this Sunday for part one. Let's join with one voice this Saturday, June 4th from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. for one hour of impact. We'll pray together outside of our church office as we do on the first Saturday of every month. Let's continue to make an impact through prayer. And now, let's have an amazing First Wednesday. Hey, Impact Church family, welcome back out to another First Wednesday. Can you believe it? It's already June, but here's the good news. God has good things in store for you. This is still our year of miraculous interventions. Come on now, believe for it. Don't let your faith get soft and flabby. Keep it strong. Let's keep going after it. Because I want to declare to you that Impact Church of South Florida is moving in 2022. Can I get an amen out there? Can I get a show you right? Can I get something? Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. That's where we're going. We're working on it. We're working on it. So please continue to be praying, you know, for that effort as we are doing all that God has called for us to do during this particular time. Now, listen, we need to dig in deeper when it comes to this thing called the church. We, we've been working on something here for the last several first Wednesdays. And I would encourage you, if you've missed any of that, go back and listen to it. It's, it's on our website. It's on our app. You can access it. It's right there where you can begin to like, meditate on things because when the purpose of a thing is not understood, abuse is inevitable. When the purpose of a, of a thing is forgotten, abuse is inevitable. And we cannot afford, God cannot afford for the church to lose its identity and therefore now not function in the earth the way that he needs and the way that he desires. So are you ready? Say yes. Oh, come on. I can't hear you out there. I need to feel you. Are you ready? Say yes. Oh, there we go. There we go. Father, we honor you. We thank you now just for your continued presence and your anointing. I trust you always, sir, for freedom of utterance in the Holy Spirit, words that are alive, explosive, dynamic, undeniable, that comes directly from you, that my speech, preaching, and teaching would not be with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of your spirit and power. We love you, sir, with all of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and dig in. Now, our core text for all of this is Matthew chapter 16, because Jesus is the head of the church. 
the concept of the church comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a man-made concept. Some man didn't, you know, uh, create this. This is now birthed, you know, out of the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus is the leader of it. So we see the first reference here of the church in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 19. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Here it is now. Jesus asked Peter and, and the others that were there too, the million, billion, trillion dollar question, who do you say that I am? That's still, you know, the most vital question for all of humanity. Who do you say that Jesus of Nazareth was and is? Peter says, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Jesus says, now you got something here, Peter. You got something, watch this, that wasn't taught to you. You caught this. You caught this directly now by revelation from my father. It says, now that revelation that you caught is what I'm going to build my church upon, praise God. I'm going to establish now, you know, this, this community upon this revelation that I am the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. So we looked at several things by way of quick review. Remember this, church is not a place we attend, but an assembly we are called to become. The church is a community, not an exclusive club for self-enhancement. The church is an assembly where everyone is loved and everyone is embraced. Always remember that the church is a duly summoned assembly that functions in the community for God's predetermined purposes. What are those purposes again? Worship, discipleship, evangelism, ministry, and there's more that we could get into on that. But today, I want to shift a little bit. I want to deal with, you know, the subject matter here of truth or dare, church or no. Come on now, truth or dare. Some of y'all remember playing that, you know, when you were growing up. Now, I don't want you to testify about the experiences because typically if you was playing truth or dare, that, that dare part was taking you off someplace. Off someplace, watch this, it probably wasn't the most godly in, in some you know, cases. I'll be the first to admit. It was some of the, the dares were crazy. But it was that game we would play of truth. Is this going to be the truth or I dare you to do X, Y, and Z? And then everyone wanted to kind of rise up and take the dare so that you could get the reward you know, behind it. Well, here it is. I want to challenge us today, truth or dare. Let's start off first with the truth. The truth is this, accept the truth that Christianity, the gospel of Christ, is the most liberating, equality-driven, and discriminationless force on the planet. I made that word up. I don't even believe that's really a word, but it is now, discriminationless. That's what the church that's what the gospel of, of Christ is all about, that it is the most liberating, watch this, for, for whatever ethnic group, whatever marginalized people, you know, whatever, you know, gender, it is the most liberating, it's the most equality driven, and it is the most discriminationless force in the planet. So listen, if we want to see a sense of social symmetry and harmony, then we got to lean into Jesus, lean into the gospel of Christ. Christ. So now we looked at something here in Acts chapter 2. Now a, a few weeks ago we just kind of finished a series called One People and, and if you did not catch that please go get it. It's, it's on our app. You can get all four you know installments of it. You need to get a hold of this so that you can understand how the church is to show a better way as it relates to you know, matters of racism, sexism, and discrimination. But here's one element that we looked at that I want to remind us of in Acts chapter 2. Verse one through four it says on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place 
Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages or other tongues as the Spirit gave them this ability. Come on now. This is the day of Pentecost. It's the day now that Jesus told his disciples, I want you to hold on and I want you to wait. I know you're eager to get out here and do some particular things, but hold on and wait. And there, Acts chapter 1, you know, paints the picture that they're in the upper room. It's 120 of them, and they're praying. They're getting before Almighty God. They begin to make different selections. They actually wind up replacing, you know, Judas' spot, who betrayed Jesus. Said, We're going to put someone else in that place. We're going to find out who God wants to be in that place. And there's a gentleman named uh, Matthias who winds up filling, you know, that void. And then Acts chapter 2, here comes the promise of what Jesus now had spoken of and that they were to wait for. The Spirit of God shows up, and he shows up in force. And now the evidence of him showing up winds up being that they begin to speak in other tongues. In this particular case, the tongues that they're speaking in, they're speaking in other languages where the people now that were gathered there began to recognize them speaking their languages and they knew that they had not been taught and they had not been learned in this these languages. So now we have this movement that begins to take place. And then I love now Peter gets up, he begins to minister, he begins to preach on some things. And now he comes to this point in verse 17 and 18 and notice what he says in the last days he's, he's quoting the prophet Joel here it says God says I will pour out my spirit upon all people your sons and daughters will prophesy your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams in those days I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Come on now, in those days. What are those days? Come on, we're in those days right now where the spirit of God is pouring out himself upon men and women alike. Now watch this. This is radical. If you understand the culture of what's going on here, you know, in the Middle East at this particular time, women were considered second class citizens in many cases, you know, property, so forth. So now for Peter to get up and say, listen, in this time now, what God is establishing, what Jesus has done, he's pouring out his spirit, not only on men. I know you're used to seeing men only the ones leading this. He says, no, no, God is pouring out his spirit upon men and women, and everyone now has an equal responsibility to carry out this gospel to the world, men and women alike. I'm telling you, when you look at it, the truth of the matter is this gospel of Christ is the most liberating, it's the most equality-driven, it's the most discriminationless force in in the earth. And listen, there is no racism. There is no sexism. There is no bigotry. There is no discrimination in Christ or in the gospel. So listen, if we want to be able to arrive to a place where we are walking this out, we got to connect with Christ. There is no substitute. There is no alternative. Legislation is not going to do it. Praise God for legislation. That's good. There's a place for that. But that's not going to change the, the human heart. We got to make sure that we continue to lean in on Jesus. Now, this is what the church is called to be. Now, it's what the whole church is called to be. But specifically here, this is what the Pentecostal church, charismatic church, has learned to lean into. And that's why you see, you know, this this force, you know, at play where now, uh, you know, charismatic, you know, ministries, Pentecostal ministries, you go back decades, you know, ago and, and longer than that. And you see these phenomenal women up ministering in force, just like you do today. But there is something that's been going on for now, you know, uh, a number of years, you know, well over 100 years. And you've seen even throughout history longer than that, other women that has been, you know, just used by God. God. Now, in some cases, some of them have been muffled by men, but the Pentecostal church, which is what we are, we are Pentecostal charismatic church. We understand now, wait a minute, God has poured out his spirit upon everybody. So let's give room for everybody, watch this, to express the gift of God that's on their life. Oh yeah, that's the truth. You want to accept now the gospel, you want to accept, you know, Christianity, because this is the most liberating, this is the most now equality driven, this is the most discriminationless force on the planet. If you want to see, watch this, equality in the earth, come to Jesus. Come on, draw in closer 
to him. And maybe you've already come to him, but you might need to take another dip in. Come on. You might need to kind of, you know, kind of come a little bit closer so that some more things and some more, you know, old ideas can be washed away. Sometimes what's holding us back is just old traditional ideas. Old, what we used to call old stinking thinking. Come on now. It's just, it just doesn't smell good because it's not lining up with the gospel of Christ. Accept that truth. Understand this particular statement. The church of Jesus is the place that humanity comes into to heal the ills of the human heart, which includes racism, sexism, and social discrimination. Racial harmony, social symmetry, and gender equality are societal virtues that can only be accomplished through relationship with God through Christ. Come on, I need to say that again. Racial harmony, social symmetry, and gender equality are societal virtues that can only be accomplished through relationship with God through Christ. That is the doorway into these things. Listen, there's so much that's going on in our culture and our society, and we should be prayerful of these things. But if we want to really see a shift, come on, if we really want to change the fruit, we got to get to the root. And the root is the human heart. And Jesus and his gospel is the only thing that has the power to be able to shift. That's why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it's the power of God. Come on now. The gospel is the power. When it's received, it can begin to transform. And trust me, I am an eyewitness. I'm a living testimony. This thing can shift you like nobody's business. I was a young man going in a completely different direction. And then the gospel and the love of God got a hold on me and shifted me, praise God, right towards him. And now I stand before you today with the awesome privilege of ministering and breaking the bread of life, you know, to you. Praise God. God has been absolutely good and phenomenal. But you got to make sure that you do not try to shirk or, or kind of uh, hide from this sense of responsibility of just coming, you know, to Jesus. Watch this. I know a lot of times somebody's watching thinking like, yeah, I know, I know, but come on, come on, just get your butt out the way. Just, just come on in. Matter of fact, bring your butt and all. God, God's not mad at it, and he don't care how big your butt is. Come on now, get, get your mind, you know, out of the gutter. Y'all y'all understand what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter what the butts are. Just come on and just say, you know what, God, I, I'm just trusting you. I'm just trusting you. And then begin the most dynamic, wonderful journey of your life. I'm telling you, God is absolutely amazing and good unto us. When you understand that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is this place where humanity comes and is healed in this way, then you will understand how important accountability is. Come on, say that, that word with me, accountability. It is extremely vital it's extremely important. Start dealing with a little bit of this on last month as we were dealing with this thing called the church, dealing with the church's significance. But let me read something to you again that goes right, right along with this that we need to make sure that we, we have down. Over the centuries, Christianity has evolved into a spiritual or religious way to meet felt needs. So it's, it's really evolved into this thing now of how do, you, do we serve ourselves? How, how, how do we create the best life for ourselves? How do we create a happy life? How, 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 do, how do I get the blessing? That's what it's evolved into. And that's, that's, not, that's not the purpose of the church. That's not the purpose of this gospel. Instead of what it is at the core, and that is a means of reforming a person and community for that matter into the image of Christ. Now, that's really what the church and that's what Christianity, you know, is, is at its core. It is to now help to reform or transform a person and community into the image of Christ. But with this particular view that, that's come up of just seeing Christianity as a way to meet felt needs, participation in church became something now that became optional. At one point, it was, it was never really optional. People understood just the value that this is, this is where my life is connected. But now it became optional since in, in this view, salvation comes directly through personal faith and experience, which is not mediated through the church. The individual is privileged at the expense of the community, so every Christian becomes his or her own spiritual authority, and there is no true accountability. 
Now, this is what I want to deal with here for, for a bit. Every individual becoming their own spiritual authority. And now we have really almost eliminated true accountability. So this brings us to the dare part. You understand the truth, but here's the dare. I dare you to embrace the security and protection God has provided for your life in this thing called the church. It's accountability over individuality. I, I dare you now to, to embrace this, this sense of security, this sense of safety, this sense of protection that God has provided for you and I in this thing called the church. And it comes through this thing called accountability, where we learn how to be accountable to others. Watch this. Other people. I know sometimes that can be uncomfortable. I know that can be uncomfortable for a number of reasons. You know, sometimes I've heard people say, well, I, I don't, I'm not going to be accountable to, to any man or any woman because, you know, they're not God. You're right. You're right. No, no pastor is God. No apostle is God. No bishop, you know, reverend, no doctor, whatever. No, none are, are God. You're right. And someone else I, I know made the statement says, you know what, pastors can be wrong too. So I should just follow what the spirit of God says to me. You are absolutely right. Pastors, you know, certainly can be wrong. I can attest to it. I've been wrong before <laughs> numerous times as a pastor, but that does not exempt us from what the Lord Jesus Christ has set up in the earth. And watch this, the structure and the protocol that he's put in place for our safety and for our protection. See, a lot of individuals, watch, watch, watch this, miss the safety and miss the protection because they completely now pull away from God's order of things. I, I like to say it this way. They, they kind of pull out of the house. If you go back, you know, when the children of Israel are being delivered from Egypt, here it is now. God told Moses, says, now you let everyone in Israel know that while they're there in Goshen, you take the blood of a lamb and you put it on the doorpost of your house and you stay in the house. Because when this death angel comes, when he sees the blood, he will pass over you. But if you're going to call yourself going to be out in the streets partying that night, oh, you, you're going to be, you know, dealt a death blow. The safety and the protection was in the house. It's st still the same with this new covenant we have today. The safety and protection is in the house. It's called the house of God the church, and you get disconnected from that, or you begin to just lightly esteem it and just treat it as just a necessary spiritual obligation, you are putting yourself in harm's way. Stay in the house. The peace is in the house. The protection is in the house. The presence is in the house. The provision is in the house. The power is in the house. It's all in the house. But if you get outside of the house, you begin to miss out on all these particular things. The dare is, I dare you to embrace the security and protection God has provided for your life in this thing called the church. Be accountable. Do not avoid accountability. Let me give you this. Beware of this personal pastoral syndrome where I'm my own pastor. Again, I'm my own spiritual authority. I don't need to listen to anyone else. Well, that's, that's a mindset that we can take, but... Again, we are removing ourselves from the house, and it's dangerous. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13 again says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. He gave apostles, he gave prophets, he gave evangelists and pastors and teachers. And you can see in other passages, there's other, you know, gifts as well. And everyone is a gift. It says their responsibility, these five gifts in particular, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, which is the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Here it is now. After Jesus, you know, death, burial, resurrection and ascension. He sends now the, the Spirit of God, what we read in Acts chapter 2. Spirit of God shows up, watch this, that not only is living within them, but now comes to rest upon them for power. But in addition to that, Jesus says, but you still need some other things to help you, watch this, walk this life out, you know, with me. You still need some other things for your safety and your protection. He says, and in particular now, I'm going to give you these ministry gifts in the form of people. 
apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And their role is to equip you. Their role is not to, you know, you know, make you feel good. Their role is to equip you so that you can do the work of Christ. That's their role. So now, we have to learn how to lean in on that. We, we have to understand, you know, the, the sense of, of value of that this is what God has called us unto. That, that this is a part of the, the accountability structure. Even if we don't think like it's needed. Even if we feel like it's 2022, that's old. That's old school. We don't need all that. Listen, back up. God hasn't changed his mind about the structure and the protocol of the church. And this sense of accountability is absolutely vital for you and me. I'm a pastor and I have a pastor. I listen, you know, to his counsel. And there's times, can we talk? There's times where there's things that were shared and I say, you know, I think there's a better way on that. But I would still honor the council because I know it's there for my protection. And see, the moment I begin to disregard it, the moment I begin to disesteem it, it no longer now, watch this, really works well for me. I, I've been doing this for, for a number of years now. And I can tell, you know, the, the distinct difference between someone who esteems my voice in their life and someone who is just like, okay, it's just another preacher. Yeah, just another preacher versus now this person being your pastor. When, when, when individuals esteem it, watch this, there, there's a draw. There, there's a draw. When, when they're talking and they're asking questions, they're literally drawing things out spiritually. Things I begin to say that I'm not thinking of, I wasn't prepared for, but they begin to draw it because they esteem it. See, with, with my own pastor, I never want to get into a position where I don't esteem it anymore. Because once I don't esteem it, I can't draw it. I can't draw it. So now things that the spirit of God may place into him for me, I can't get it out. Not because he doesn't want to release it, but because I don't esteem it. Got to make sure you keep the sense of accountability strong. It is vital. Let's look at an example of this, you know, working in the early church. Acts chapter 13, verse 1 says this. Among the prophets and teachers of the church, at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manian, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. So there's the prophets, there's the teachers of the church, and then there's these five individuals. One day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, that's a good thing to do always, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Oh, man. I love this. There's, there's so much that, that's going on here. Now, now, no, notice the protocol that's really illustrated here when Paul and Barnabas are being called by God. An individual gives voice to God's instruction. So when it says the Holy Spirit says it, it, it wasn't a voice from heaven, this was someone in the church, likely one of the prophets and teachers that are there that now the spirit of God comes upon and he begins to share that, OK, God's calling you to, you know, to this you know, uh, particular service. Now, what happens after that? Although they have this word from God, Paul and Barnabas, they're still uh, conscious of their accountability to the church. Hence, they don't, you know, just kind of get up and, and go. They're still accountable. They, they still understand, okay, yeah, we heard that. We received that. Man, that's good from God. But they stay right there. They don't go anywhere. As a matter of fact, the, the scripture goes on and says, so after more fasting and prayer, after they heard this, everybody, Paul, Barnabas, Simeon, Manian, uh, you know, all, all of them, the prophets and teachers, all of them continue to pray. What, what, what's going on? They're now taking the time before God to confirm that this is really something from God. Now, Paul and Barnabas don't do that, you know, for a certain period of time. It says, OK, yeah, we got it. We believe it. We're gone. We see y'all. That's not what they do. They stay accountable to those who they trust as leaders. 
So even though they got this word from God, they stay right in there in this place of prayer. And then what the scripture says here, it says, so after more fasting and prayer, the men, come on now, this is the prophets and the teachers, laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? See, a part of the process of being sent out by the Holy Spirit involves this human accountability. They didn't go until the leaders of the church laid their hands upon them, signifying that, yep, one, it, it is a word from God. Two, we are now endowing a, uh, an empowerment upon you and within you to go ahead and carry it out. And now Paul and Barnabas, they stayed accountable. Well, let me use this word. They stayed submissive until they got that from their leaders. Now, this is a dynamic in the church structure that, that completely now individuals run away from. Why? Because everyone's their own spiritual authority. Well, I believe this is what God says, so this is what this is I'm going to do. Well, listen, if it is what God said, it will stand up against scrutiny. So you can present it unto your leaders, and your leaders will do just like in you know, cases like this. Hey, let's, let's, let's pray over this. Let, let's pray over this further. Let, I'll, I'll let you know what I got on it. But see, individuals don't like to do that because in our mind, that's being controlled by someone. But see, in, in the kingdom mind, in, in the church mindset, that's for your safety and that's for your protection. That's how God sees it. I mean, this passage of scripture, I love it. And, and a lot of times people reference it as like, yes, you know, see, you know, when Paul and Barnabas, you know, they got called and they, they went out. They did not, they did not went out. They did not go out. They were sent out by the Holy Spirit and their sending out, you know, was inclusive of the leaders now saying, yes, that's God go. That's a part of the process of the spirit of God sending you out. But see, this requires accountability. So you can't you can't function like that and not be accountable. See, if you, if you don't have accountability, you can't do that. And see, watch this. What what happens as a result of the sense of accountability? The Apostle Paul in particular, now completely revolutionizes the whole region with the gospel to the point that today we're still reading his words, meditating upon it, ordering our lives by them. Why? Because he knew how to be accountable. Come on, thousands of years later, there's more writings in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul than anyone else including, you know, Jesus. Jesus didn't write anything, but the words that were written down that he said, we got more from the Apostle Paul in these letters than we do from him. It's amazing. How do we get that? Accountability. Accountability. Paul understood, I need to lean in, you know, to my leaders here. I hear what the Spirit of God is saying. I, I hear that. But now let, let me see. What, what, what do you all say on this? Do you agree? And now when the agreement came, watch this, then the blessing comes and they get sent out. See, there's a, a, a complete huge difference between being sent out and people that went out. Now, I share it with you. We're a Pentecostal church and, you know, Pentecostal denomination is, you know, huge uh, throughout the world. But one of the downfalls to Pentecostalism is this, you know, um, existential kind of experiential, you know, you know, feeling of, listen, I got this from God and therefore I don't need to, you know, I don't, I don't need to learn. I, I don't, I don't, I don't need anybody to instruct me. God's called me and I'm, I'm, I'm opening up a church. Listen, that is foolish. All right. I, I can't say that any clearer. That is 100% foolish. The gospel is very simple, but I got news for you. There's a whole lot of complexity about how it's been built. And so if you're going to be responsible to lead people, if you're going to be responsible, you know, as an individual that people now are, are really are supposed to submit to and be accountable to, you got to take the time to learn. You got to take the time, watch this, to be submitted yourself. Otherwise, how are you going to ask someone else to be accountable to you? And you can't be accountable to anyone else. Well, that's a word of, of the Lord for somebody there. Grab hold to it. Stop just simply, you know, running out, doing whatever it is you feel like you want to do, and then want to blame God. Use God as the scapegoat. What God said. No, he didn't. He didn't, say, he didn't say a word because you won't take the time to process things through his structure of the church. If it's God, it'll stand up against the scrutiny. 
It will absolutely do so. Last point is this. Beware of the private spiritual advisor mentality. So a lot of times individuals, okay, maybe, maybe I, I'm not my own spiritual authority, but, but I have my own private spiritual advisor, you know. Um, in, in, in today's culture, you know, we have, you know, life coaches, we have mental therapists, you know, we have all types of, you know, folks. That's, that's not the same. Let, let, me, let me be clear. That's not the same as the structure and the protocol that God has established in the church. There's value in those things, but, but the heavenly safety and protection comes through you learning how to yield, you know, to the structure and protocol of the church. And i.e. these spiritual gifts that God has put. God's put into the, the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He didn't put life coaches in there. He didn't, he didn't put, you know, mental therapists. That's not in the list. These things are good. There's nothing wrong with those. But, but you got to make sure you're hanging on what God established first and foremost. That's where your spiritual accountability should connect to. In the Old Testament, there's this really, really intriguing story that pops up in the book of Judges. Judges is an account of several individuals who wind up leading the children of Israel as judges. Samson, you know, is one, you know, uh, Deborah, you know, is another, and, and, and various ones that are listed, you know, throughout, you know, the, the book of Judges. This is the time before they had a king. But right in the middle of the book almost, in Judges chapter 17 and 18, the scripture like goes a, a, a completely different way. And it starts talking about this guy named Micah. He's not a judge. And the chapter 17 opens up where he learns that his mother had put out a curse upon whoever stole like 1,100, you know, pieces of silver, you know, from her. He goes to his mother and says, you know what, mom, it was me. So his mom applauds him for his honesty. And says, and as a result of your honesty, tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to take some of this, these 1,100, you know, uh, you know, pieces of silver. We're going to take 200 of them. And now we're going to take them to the blacksmith, have him kind of melt it down and create an idol. Just for you, because of what you've done. Micah now takes that. He gets the idol from the blacksmith and now sets it up in his house, you know, as an instrument of worship. Listen, this is very much off base. And this, again, the story just shows up right in the middle of Judges as if it's completely disconnected, but it's not. In the process of time, there's a Levite who is trying to find a place, you know, to live. He's leaving Bethlehem and he's looking for a place, you know, to live. He comes across, you know, where Micah lives, which is, you know, the hill country of Ephraim. And he comes to Micah's house and he's like, yeah, can, can I stay here, you know, you know, for the night, so forth, I don't have any place to stay. And Micah recognizes that he's a Levite. Now, Levites are those that were called to be in attendance in the tabernacle and the temple once it got built. That's what their calling was. They, they, were, they were called to do nothing else but to attend to the service of God in the tabernacle and in the temple. Why this Levite is just roaming all over the countryside we, we can only, you know, suspect that it's a, just an act of rebellion. Well, when Micah has, you know, his new idol in the house, he takes one of his sons and he sets up one of his sons to be the priest, you know, over, you know, his idol and now, you know, his shrine and his, you know, thing of worship. But when this Levite comes along, he says, hey, man, look, I will pay you if you stay with me and you can be my personal priest. And the Levite said, huh. Well, that's an interesting deal. I'll take it. And he becomes this, this man, Micah's personal priest. See, unfortunately, a lot of times we can look at the church in that kind of lens. Like a, a pastor or a minister or apostle or whoever, this is my kind of my private spiritual advisor. You know, this is, this is, this is my own that, that I just hold on to. And they, they give me, you know, the wisdom and things that I need. The problem with the whole story that you see in Judges chapter 17 and 18 is that, number one, the Levite was abandoning his calling because the, the Levite was called to the tabernacle and hence the community, not one person. 
And it's really the same today. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Not, not called to one person. We're called to the community. Community. Serving God. Serving his people. Not just one person. And now we have this case where Micah refuses to submit to God's order. Now, during this particular time, there was no temple. So they only had the tabernacle and the tabernacle was set up in Shiloh. Where was Shiloh? Not very far from where Micah lived. It was right there in that same hill country in, in Ephraim. But for whatever reason, Micah didn't want to be inconvenienced. Micah wanted to set things up just in his own house. This works good for me. This works you know, better for me. I got my own Levite and now I can just worship God. And, and, and God is looking at this like, this is crazy. What are you doing? One, this Levite should be at the tabernacle where he's serving everyone. Two, Micah, you should be bringing yourself to the tabernacle to worship me. And three, you need to make sure you get rid of them idols. That's not a part of my worship. But it, it, it gives us insight to how easily we can start to try to adopt a, 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 a private, personal, spiritual advisor. And then watch this. And then if they're not if they're not doing what we want them to do, we just kind of fire them and go get another one. That's not the structure of the church. That's not the structure of the church at all. See, God, God, God calls men, women, families unto a church body. Now, I know we live in a consumer, you know, kind of a mindset and mentality today. So we kind of shop for everything. Come on, we shop for groceries. We're looking for the best deal. You know, we, we, we're shopping around. You know, who got the best barber? You know, they can cut my hair, you know, the right way at, a, at an affordable price. Ah, you know, what about church? What, what church can I go to? What's going to give me the best value? You know, what, what you got for me? What's going to add, you know, value to my family? It's a consumer mindset, and it's, it's very unfortunate because that's not what God has called the church to be. We got to flip it and understand, wait a minute. I'm, I'm here for the church. The church is really not here for me because I am the church. Oh, did you catch that? See, a lot of times we look at it as like, well, the church is for me. Well, obviously it's a community, so it does, you know, feed, you know, one another. But the real heart and mindset should be, wait a minute, what, what is it that I can do for the church? I'm here for the church. You know, John F. K., you know, years ago, you know, said, you know, one of our presidents, he says, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. See, that's the mindset really from the kingdom of God. You know, ask not what the church can do for you, but what can you do for your church? The church that you are, that you are a part of in the community that you belong to. And again, God calls us into those kind of relationships. And once God calls us into those relationships, listen, we want to be very careful before we start breaking away and just want to do our own thing, become our own, you know, spiritual authority. Like, well, you know, uh, my, my season is up. I've heard all kinds of stuff. My, my time, you know, you know, so on and so forth. Well, wait, wait a minute. What does God say? What, what does God say? Has, has God said that? Or, or now are you just offended? Or now you feeling like, well, I'm not, I'm not getting my way or I'm not getting what I want. That's not justification for you to up and leave where God has planted you. And listen, you grow best where you're planted. If you if you're never planted somewhere and listen, a part of the planning process is this item of submission and accountability. When you have that in place in your character, you will flourish in the kingdom of God. Absolutely. And it'll be phenomenal. And so many people's lives will be blessed as a result of it. And you'll look up and God will say, ah, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Why? Because you understood how to stay planted, how to be submissive and how to be accountable. Yeah, we're not our own spiritual authority. We're not our own personal pastors. We don't just simply get a, a spiritual advisor. Come on, God calls us to a place and he expects for us to submit to it. Submit into that place and the leadership that he's placed there. He expects for that. And then watch this. God says, now you're in the house. Now you are afforded, you know, uh, the, the full measure of safety, protection. Come on now. You, you're, you're afforded all that now because you're in the house. Stay in the house. Come on, if you, if you haven't gotten into the house, come on, get into the house. 
just because you're watching on, on a Wednesday night, praise God, I'm glad you are. But get into the house. Get into the house and be connected. Get into the house and, and be accountable. Get into the house and be submissive. Submissive is not a soft term. It's not a weak term. It, it, it takes a great strength of character to know how to submit unto God and what God has put in place. But I got news for you. The rewards of it are phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. But that's not why we do it. We do it just simply because we love God. So do, do this for me. Everyone, where, wherever you are right now, come on, lift up two hands under heaven with me. Come on, let's just bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we honor you and bless you, Lord God. We magnify your name and give you praise and glory. There is absolutely none like you. You are our king, and we love you, sir, with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our praise. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Now, keep your eyes closed, your head bowed right there where you are. Listen, I want to invite you. I want to invite you in deeper. If you have yet to kind of cross that line and, and, and come into a submissive relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and watch this, an IE connect with the church, I want to invite you in today. I want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. Or maybe you're someone that, yep, you say, yep, I, I've, I've given my life to Christ. But, but watch this, you, you've yet to kind of really get fully connected with his church to be submissive, to be accountable. Come on, I want to pray for you too. I want to pray for you too because... That means you need to make a rededication. You, you started something that you didn't finish. You, you said yes to Jesus. You took one step, but he wanted you to take two. You, you want to take the second step as well. So there's two invitations out there. Number one, you, you just want to get in on this relationship with Almighty God through Christ. Or number two, you want to now rededicate your life and say, you know what? I'm already in this relationship, but I need to take a step further. I need to take a step further now to, to become more acquainted and, and more committed to his church, which you are. So if one of those two invitations speaks to your heart, I want to pray for you. I know I want to pray with you. So let's do this. We're going to pray together. Everybody, everybody, let's do it. Come on. Lift up two hands under heaven. Say this out loud with me. Father, thank you again for your son, Jesus, who you gave for me, who lived for me, who died for me and who rose for me. Today, Jesus, I embrace you and your plan and purpose for my life. I turn my back on sin, and I thank you for making me your own. Amen and amen. Come on, somebody just rejoice right there for a moment. Father, we honor you and thank you so much for that, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy, for welcoming us into your presence. Oh, what a privilege and an honor. And furthermore, Daddy, I want to pray for those that are making a fresh dedication and a rededication of their life, renewing their commitment. Father, my prayer is that you strengthen them with might by your spirit in their inner man. Father, may the, the old stinking thinking be washed away by the truth of your gospel. And may they boldly and courageously rise up, Father, to be a, a committed, active, submissive part of your church that understands the value of being accountable to others. Father, we declare your blessing be upon them, that this decision that they're making today will be one that they continue to make over and over and over every day of their lives as they honor and worship you. So we love you. And we give you thanks and praise for this too. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much, Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now do this for me. If you responded to either one of those two invitations, would you please do this? Text the, the, the word decided to the number that you see, you know, coming up on the screen or type it into the, the chat. We just want to know and be able to rejoice with you and pray, you know, for you and with you. And for, for those of you, if you haven't received one, we'll send you an electronic version of a devotion that will help you in the next steps that you need to take. One of those next steps is this. Get yourself fully connected. Come on, make this summer a summer where I'm fully connected with God and his church. I'm fully connected. So I'm not just simply a spectator. I'm not just simply, you know, now just coming around, but, but I'm fully engaged. I'm fully engaged. I'm allowing myself to be equipped so that I can do the work of Christ. I challenge you on that. I dare you. I dare you to step up and do it. You can do it. Make this summer 
the best summer you and Jesus have ever had. I dare you. And if you do it, I, I'm telling you right now, at the end of the summer, you'll look up and say, wow, this has been the greatest time of my life. And I want to invite you to join us right at Impact Church. So you can catch us, you know, at the Regal, you know, theaters on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. You can come out and join us. It's safe. We make sure it's clean, you know, for, for ourselves so that there's no issues there. Come on out. Bring your family. Bring your friends. Bring your children so that we can all continue to be fully equipped to grow fully in Christ. We love you. We're praying for you. We're declaring God's best and blessing over your life. Be strong. Stay faithful. And let's keep digging deeper. We'll see you soon. Bye.